What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another edition of Talking Titans with the Sick Podcast. Another great episode ahead. Even greater guests we're bringing on. Got a lot to cover. Can't wait to get into it. Sammy, start me off. Turn up your volume. Your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast. The Sick Podcast. Talking Titans. Ladies and gentlemen, 94 yards. Touchdown, Titans! He just took her to the house. The sickest Tennessee Titans podcast. Sick! It's going to be sick. Sick, sick, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to another edition of Talking Titans. Uh, I guess you could say this is our first uh, official off-season show, considering uh, the season wrapped up officially last night. Had a great game to watch, one of the better ones of recent memory, um, and we got a lot to cover. We got an incredible guest on tonight, uh, and you know, let's just jump right into it. So, uh, let's bring in our guest. If you don't know him, then you should probably get out from under the rock you're living under, because uh, all Titan fans know of his work. He's a national reporter covering the Titans for ESPN, Mister Teron Davenport. TD, how you doing tonight, my friend? Hey, what's going on, fellas? I'm awesome. What up, T? Thanks for coming on, man. Yeah. yeah. For sure. First and foremost, thank you very, very much for taking the time out of your night to uh, join us for a little Titans talk. Uh, before we get into anything, what did you think of the game last night? Oh, man, it was it was great. I, I've i always been a big Jalen Hurts guy. Had him on talking with TD. Just I didn't I knew the Titans were going to draft him, but I, I just wanted to talk shot with him. You know, so we had him on. I, I feel this way. He is an elite quarterback and you have some of those who still have their doubts but like Patrick Mahomes said there shouldn't be any doubts after what he did last night and I know he had to fumble and that was the scoop and score but he drove him back man he's the ultimate triple threat so I really like seeing that uh, Mahomes is just you know I feel like he's a top five all-time quarterback now already yeah and it's crazy to, to reach that status in, in five years but you look at five years he started he's been first team all pro uh twice second team all pro Pro Bowl for what that's worth, two Super Bowl MVPs, two MVP. I mean, legend. This goes on. Yeah, I mean it goes on. We do the rest of the show on that. So for me, it was the quarterback play. Love seeing AJ get the touchdown. Um, I just hate that that call. It's like, man, let that ride. Oh, At the end of the game, going to be my next question. What you thought yeah. of that Bradbury call? Yeah, let it ride. And as as a guy with a receiver background, I, I, I'm. I'm still saying let let that ride, man, because I, I just think it didn't impact that play <laughs> enough for it to be called. And if you look at it, you look at the rule book, if the ball is uncatchable in pass interference, you could pick the flag up. And in holding, you, you don't. But still, it wasn't catchable. I he mean, wasn't that. just like let it ride, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he, with that stage in the game, third and eight, and you got a minute and 48 on the clock, you can't make that call. And especially the defender has the right to put his hands on you at, uh, between five yards, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. You had that. Uh, I mean, it was, it's like insolential contact on my. Right. It, it, it was, was ticky tack. But close. they're always inclined to throw the flag when the DB's hand is around the hip of the receiver. So. You know, I don't know. A lot of Eagles fans you, talking. You know about- what he called, and because on the pool report afterwards, it wasn't the hand around the hip. And you're right; they typically will call that. They called the the jersey. They said he pulled the jersey. That's Bradbury what the guy admitted to it. Didn't pull the flag. Bradbury admitted to it. I think that yeah. it, it was a bad call. I would have let it ride, but absolutely. Uh, I, I live in South Jersey. I watched the game in Philly last night, uh, so. I don't know. There was a lot of opportunities for the Eagles to put them away, and they didn't oh, capitalize on it. So was it a bad call? Yes, but, you know, they're talking about it like it was, you know, it robbed them of the whole game. Mm-hmm. But they were still going to kick a field goal even if it wasn't the penalty, and the Eagles were going to have to go down there and score. So there's no yeah. guarantee that mm-hmm. if that penalty wasn't called, they would have won. But, yeah, I think it was it was ticky-tack. But yeah, let it ride. Man. Listen, the cardinal rule with playing the Chiefs is – do not allow Patrick Mahomes to win a football game. And unfortunately, even though they tied it up, 
they gave that man time to win the football game, and that's exactly what he did. So, um, you know, oh, I mean, th- what the Eagles did in one year is incredible. You got to give their GM a lot of credit, and uh, I'm sure we'll touch on some things that maybe our GM, our new GM, could do. Um, but moving forward into our beloved Titans, uh, since our last show, TD, obviously the news broke that uh, Tim Kelly would be elevated uh, to the offensive coordinator position. Now, this yeah. topic you could probably argue is very split amongst Titan fans. Some wanted an outside hire. Some are thrilled that this that Tim was elevated. Um, I trust you more than anybody with the X's and O's because I know you're an X's and O's guy. Um, for us fans out there, what do you think we should be expecting in the 2023 season from a Tim Kelly offense? I think what you could expect is this passing game is going to improve. And I, I think whoever's the quarterback, whether it's Tannehill or CJ Stroud or, you know, Josh Dobbs, Malik, well, whoever it is, I think is going to blossom. I think they're going to have a really good year because you look at the years that Tim Kelly was OC in Houston. Deshaun Watson had his best, he had his career year. Oh, absolutely. And then you look at he got Davis Mills. He got production out of Davis Mills. I mean, if you guys remember that 2021 season, he and Danny Amendola, they were eating Elijah Molden alive. It, you know what I mean? And Elijah's my guy, you know what I mean? But I'm gonna keep it keep it real. They were picking them apart. So I, I think what you could expect is a little more of that play action, the strike route, the A we basically could call it the AJ play. And uh, you could expect that more, but it's also going to be having Traylon Burks for a full year because there was a stretch last year where they didn't really run that play action strike route. And that was because really, I mean, who are you going to throw it to? In, in exactly. that you know, but now you get another receiver that can help out. You look at a guy like a Zay Flowers. I think he should really be on the Titans um, target for the draft because he reminds me a lot of Brandon Cooks. Right. And, and when you see that, and I, I made a reference to Joey Galloway. I, I try to show the catalog there, took it back to, to the days with that explosive type of player. And I say all that to say, if you go back and you watch Houston, you see a lot of slot fades. You see, you know, Brandon Cooks getting really he, he's getting highlighted, you know, and they, they run a lot of uh, flat curl, those type of combos. And that just gets a playmaker, the, the the football. And I think Zay Flowers would be a really good option yards after catch. So you could see the passing game, I think, is going to be improved. Long story short. Well, you, you say Zay Flowers. I've seen you, like I said, you're one of the, the best guys I follow on Twitter. I love your X's and O's, how you break down everything and how you even bring up players, you know, on, on, on your uh, on your Twitter feed. I saw la- last week you, you brought up Kayshawn Booty. As another mm-hmm. explosive, uh, mm-hmm. explosive player uh, in the draft, what what do you think? Like you said, how how do you compare last year to this year with him? Is it the quarterback play? Do you see him like falling in the draft, like a late to a second, second or third round pick for us? Like over over Zay Flowers, would you pick him? I love Zay Flowers, man. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's in my conversation for wide receiver one. Just to you know, really? be with you, yeah, he's I, I value him that much. And you go back, like you watch the Louisville game. Um, he he killed he killed Louisville. He's a very fun player to watch. But when you, you look at Keshawn Butte, I, I think with him, it's really and that play that I showed, it was off coverage against Roger McCreary. And he, you know, caught and ran away from him. Um I think with him, what you have to figure out is how to tap into his mental side of things. He's yeah. one of those players that those meetings. And the top 30 visits, they're going to be critical because it's very clear that he's talented, but you've got to figure out, okay, what happened from last year to this year? And I think if you look, I wonder if he and Brian Kelly gel. You know what I mean? Because sometimes yeah. you can clash with your head coach, and, and if you're of a mindset, you'll allow that to alter your production on the field. So that could be the case. And if that was the case, and that's where a guy like Rand Carthon, having him just be able to relate, you know, that's going to be uh, key to in, in the meeting. So I think he'll be there at, at 41. I actually, I don't want to say I know, but I, I'm, I'm almost positive he would be there at 41. It will be a great pick, you know, because he's another one of those guys who's just a playmaker with the football yeah. in his hands. Now, who do you think, uh, not to sound redundant, we ask it every week, 
will be throwing the ball in Tim yeah. Kelly's offense for the 2023-2024 Tennessee Titans. Your best educated guess as to at least maybe what the quarterback room might look like. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be Tannehill, Dobbs, and Malik Willis. I think that's what it's going to look like. Yeah, there's conversation uh, about the, uh, the the Titans supposedly contacting the Bears. I wouldn't be surprised if they did, and they should, right? Because if you don't have that guy at quarterback that you feel is going to go neck and neck with the Mahomes, with the Josh Allens, with the Joe Burrows, the Lamar Jacksons, you definitely need to inquire and, and try to find a way to go get one. So. I think it's still going to be Tannehill uh, for at least a year, but I, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If I'm the Titans, I'm moving off of 11. I'm coming, going back in, in, in that first round. Really? And there's players, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, well, there's only, because I think, was it Ty McShay? I think it was. Somebody has said there's only uh, like 14 guys that they have a, a, a true for, first round grade on. I would say you better go back and, and, and look again because. There's 30 to 40, in my opinion, but you can move back and I would do that, acquire another first. Next year, go get Caleb Williams because he's that dude. So that brings me, yeah, that brings me to my next question. There's a running joke on this show of my uh, my love for Malik Willis and how it, it has been un, unwavered for a while now. Um, but my question to you is like, and this, this has always been my argument when people are trying to come at me and tell me it's a waste of time to even attempt to try to progress this young man into becoming the Titan starter. Uh, what he had to work with in the very small sample size that he was given um, was essentially impossible to really critique him of what his ceiling might be. Um, and on top of that, it, I think it's an injustice to Malik that because the fact that um, Joshua Dobbs came in and performed better, uh, not to mention he's been in the league three times longer than Malik has, or actually more probably. Six times longer. Six times more. <laughs> um, that that's something that should count against Malik, and I think that's absurd. What do you, th as someone is very close to the organization, I mean, what do you think the temperature in the room is on him? Do you think his time unfortunately passed? Uh, do you foresee him really getting another shot to compete for, for at least a backup role? What do you feel the temperature in the room is on Malik Willis? I think he's going to get a shot to compete for at least a backup role. All options are on the table, to be honest with you. And I remember talking to Malik a few times, just, you know, just asking him where he was mentally, you, you know, and how things were um, and during training camp. And, and especially like when he got the start uh, against the Ravens, you know, to open up the preseason. I remember asking him how Vrabel – was with him you know is, is he telling you that you got to make plays from the pocket is he telling you to just go out and be a playmaker like what's and he said that Vrabel was like man just go out there and make plays you know sometimes if you got to stay in the pocket stay in the pocket but be you and I think that was a really good kind of launching point for him but it didn't really launch him to anywhere because of all the circumstances that that you mentioned but then you move it forward to what the week the week before the Jaguars game, I asked Vrabel about Dallas. development, right? And he said that it's been tough for Willis to develop because in practice, they're going through walks, walk, walk through pace. A lot of the reps that he would have gotten and to develop, I mean, you look at how some of these guys that, that waited before they started, they got acclimated to the league and to that speed by practicing full speed. They couldn't do that. So I thought it was interesting that Mike Vrabel, because, you know, he's not normally one to make an excuse or, or, you know, give an explanation like that. And and he laid it down there. And then I also asked uh, Pat O'Hara, who's now the past game analyst, I asked him about Willis's development and he, he complimented him on, on just learning and processing better. But he says sometimes – you got to take the stairs, not the elevator. So I, it made me like, okay, I guess it's it's not going at that pace that he yeah. wants it to go. Do you like kind of blame the coaching staff, whether it be Todd Downing or even Mike Vrabel? Because when they had the game plan against Kansas City, I believe it was, where he had a great first half. Of, is that right, guys? Is that the game I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. 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 Uh, he, had, he, he had a great first half. And then all of a sudden, like, Todd Downing did Todd Downing in the second half. He, he, he couldn't call plays. He couldn't do anything. So is it more of coaching you're, you're trying to say with that? 
I think it's everything. his development. I, I think it's everything. It's 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 coaching. It's Malik himself. It's circumstance. I, I think it's it's all of the above. Uh, the blame can go around, and because there were times. I mean, you look at remember when Chig ran that route. It was it was the was it the Kansas City game? I think it was Kansas City. Chig ran a route. It was like a wheel route, and he was wide open. And Malik saw him. It was Houston because oh, Willis saw him. And he held it, and then he rushed to throw it, and it overshot him. And it's like, man. And that was yeah. one of the things, if you remember, with, with Mariota. Vrabel, I remember one of my first conversations with Vrabel was about Mariota. Uh, and he, he was like, you know, he has to see it, believe it, and rip it. And that's mm. what Willis had to do in that situation. Yeah, and that's all, and honestly what Dobbs is doing. I'm, I'm sorry, man. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's all right. Yeah, so the, the the crazy thing about that is in, in the Jags game, I, I was shocked by how much confidence Joshua Dobbs had before the old line deteriorated on him. And I was mm. saying to myself, you know, he had so much poise and and he he yeah. believed every throw that he that he threw. So yeah, I see what you're saying, hundred percent. Go ahead, Vin. Well, that was going to be my question. Using the word deteriorating, the last two years the Titans have been mangled with injuries and used more players than I think in the history of the game. You mm-hmm. know. Oh, and I know last year they set the record, but the last two years has to be a record as well. Right. So um, I was wondering what you might attribute that to. Obviously, it's the NFL. Everyone gets hurt. But it seems like this was too common to be, you know, just a coincidence. There had to be some underlying issue. Are they not taking care of themselves? Is the training staff a little not to use the word in ep, but maybe, you know, not the quality that we wish they, you know, so. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's the thing that's so confusing because you, you look at AJ. He goes to Philly and plays a full season. He didn't do that once here. You know what I mean? There was always like some type of underlying nagging thing that he was dealing with. And what was was very interesting was it the reverse. I think Philly had a trainer come here. No, the Titans had had someone uh, the year I came. One of their head trainers went to Philly. So, yeah, it's crazy. But I I think a lot of it has to do with the way that they play, you know, how physical their their style of play is. I think it has to do with that. I I don't – it's tough to blame the training staff and and the doctors, you know, because there's all types of equipment and things that they do. Um, I thought it was interesting that Mike Vrabel – said about guys have to be a professional football player after four o'clock when they leave the building. That was interesting. But I know that you have Arate, which is by uh, Adam Bobo. That's a, a recovery suite, I guess you could call it. It's it's a place where they go. And I mean, they get the injections, like the B, the vitamin injections, like the cocktails, they have the, um, uh, hyperbaric chamber, cryotherapy, all that stuff. Derrick Henry started with them, and a, a bunch of guys go now. Um, so I know a lot of guys are doing stuff outside of the the building. I really don't know what to blame it on. It, it's 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 crazy. Yeah, it's wild. It's I guess what it's it's, it's got to be more than just one thing, you know. But yeah. I found that interesting too when when Vrabel said that, and he's a guy that really preaches accountability. So. You know, um, but yeah, I mean, I figured I'd take a shot with that because it's just, it was just so insane this year. You were just waiting for it every week. You know, who's yeah. who's going to be next, you know? It, it's it's amazing. Even so being in Philly, you know, covering the Eagles, I got there right after Chip Kelly left. And, you know, Chip Kelly, like the king of sports science. Yeah. And Doug Peterson kept a lot of the things that they did. And one of the things that they always made sure they had uh, sleep, they would, you know, monitor the guy's sleep, but they also had, they each coming out of practice, coming off the field, there'll be a table sitting there and everybody has their own custom shape that was made for them. I yeah, say that I like that. this. Yeah, you know. I remember um, that. I started to see some of that with the Titans this past year. And then also you would see, so you come in and right there on the side, there was, you will see the shapes. But then also they had like the little uh, health waffles, um, different things that they could take, like different supplements and things like that, that they could take. So you, you did see a, see that change. I didn't see that before. Um, 
Mike Vrabel, when I asked him about analytics, he touched on how they monitor guys, like what percentage they, they go as far as uh, speed and, and just their their distance and stuff like that. So I thought that was interesting also. So it's not like they're totally dropping the ball. They're trying to do things. They're, they, you know, they have the, the little trackers in their, in their uh, shoulder pads, or it's actually in their, their undergarment that, that they, that they wear. Hmm. Just to switch something up, my bad, Sal. Just to no, switch ahead, something up on, uh, into personnel wise, there was a, a hire late last week in Chad Brinker, Mm-hmm. And uh, Rand Carthon brought him in as like a new uh, analytics role to the team. Uh, what do you see? Like, because they, they wanted to go into like a Cleveland Brown style, um, I guess, developing players, I guess, or bringing players in. What do, you, what do you see him as his role moving forward for them, bringing guys in or ha- how they analyze people? Yeah. So with Chad Brinker, his, his big thing is going to be working with contracts. That's what he was very uh, involved with in Green Bay. I love the fact that he's a former player. I'm not going to say you have to have played the game to know how to look at it, but it gives you different perspectives that you may not be able to have acquired from learning about the game from afar. You you know what I mean? But I I like that part of him. I I think really it's going to – I want to see how that works as far as he and Vin Marino because Vin Marino has been their contract negotiator. Forever. Right. And and now Brinker's there. I want to see – you know, how that whole thing and works. We, and we got a lot of money to uh, either get away, get, get rid of, or or bring in because we got some cuts that we're going to be making. Yeah, yeah. They, they, uh, there's some things that have to happen. <laughs> Might want to spend a week or two with, with Howie Roseman and learn, learn some of those yeah. cap gymnastics because I've seen him do some crazy things. Absolutely. And that, that leads me to the question that I was going to ask you. Obviously, there are uh, a plethora, you could argue, of players that are realistically on the fence right now whether or not you're going to see them on the field next year. I'm talking guys that are like Bud Dupree, Robert Woods, Taylor Lewan, uh, amongst others, David Long, uh, Cunningham, and multiple guys. Um, you're, you're obviously, you're very close to the organization. Are, are, is there anyone that I might have mentioned that you think is safe to bet might not be on the team next year? Or is, you know, oh, yeah. is there a lot of uncertainty? Yeah, well, two of them. You got, obviously, Lewan. And Zach Cunningham, Zach, Zach Cunningham's gone. They, they can't, okay. they can't pay that amount of money for a the production that they're getting, but b the availability. You know, and mm-hmm. unfortunately for Lawan, availability has been a a bad thing also for him. And you know, he's he's yeah, they, they're not going to keep him. No. David Long is interesting. I think another guy to look at that um, they do need to keep around. I feel like they'll find a way because he brings a different energy and juice to to the team. And one of the things I love. Uh, he always tells me, like, man, they're going to feel me this week. They're going to feel me. And it's just mm. – I'm just writing and talking about the game, and I get get a little charged. So I could only imagine when you're out there with him and, you know, how he gives that energy off. So I think he's he's going to be back. Uh, Nate Davis is the one that I'm really mm. intrigued by. That's just yeah. what I was going to ask you, especially I, after Jim Wyatt, you know, right. wrote that he doesn't think he will be back. And I actually brought it up at the end of the show, I think, after Jim left. Do you think something like uh, a franchise tag could be in play for him? Because, you know, he is a guard and no. No, I, I think he's going to price himself uh, out of there. Um, I would be surprised if they, they placed a tag on him. He's had some availability issues also, you know, yeah, over then, his career. Then so. you're, really, you're really looking at yeah, you're four, new, four new starters. Oh, so right. I, I brought up a, a good point. I don't even know if it's a good point, but, I, I, you know, whatever. It's my point. I made a point last week. MPF was a natural left tackle, correct? At Ohio State. Yeah, he played. He played left. Yeah. If you bump him over to left, and you like get a uh, a guy like uh, Mike McGlinchey from San Francisco, and you plug him mm-hmm. in at right, I mean, you you have play there in the draft or even free agency. What do yeah, you think? You could you could definitely do that, right? And that allows you to, if you want to move off of pick eleven, you yeah. can, or you could just go pure best player available, right? right? And I've seen Mox sending Quentin Johnston to the the Titans. Um, Zay Flowers is a better player. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not a big Johnson guy. I yeah, feel like- there's there's too many inconsistencies with, with him. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. uh, I, I wouldn't take that at 11. I wouldn't take Zay Flowers at 11 either, just, you know, mm. make sure we're clear. But um, to your point, though, McGlinchey is a guy, and, and Jarrett Stillman, I don't know if you heard – uh, Stillman accompanied today, but he he has said that 
you know, McGlinchey would absolutely be open to, to coming to the Titans. That's so, a San Francisco that's, guy with Rand Carthon, too. So. Right, right. Now, I think you look at Andre Dillard, I think he would cost a bit less. Obviously, less proven than McGlinchey, but you have to look at the situation there. He's an ideal player for the Titans, in my opinion, in that you don't have to break the bank for him. You could probably get 10 to 11 million per, you, you know. And he's someone who has first round talent, but it was situational. And he, you're going to, you know, that he's well coached because you, you know, Jeff Stoutland is an outstanding offensive line coach. The Jordan Milata situation that was, I remember they drafted him. That was specifically Jeff Stoutland wanted to go that route. And he took, and he personally molded Milata into the left tackle that he is. And in the process of doing that, your first round pick was collateral damage. So that's why he'll be available. And he could play right if you want him to play right. He's played both for, for the Eagles, but I think that should be the left the left tackle. If they stand put at eleven, who do you think they they go with? Yeah, it's tough when you have uh free agency still, we haven't even tapped into that. Um if it were right now, like looking at the roster that they have right now. I think a Paris Johnson, you know, Broderick Jones, those are guys to look at. Uh, Dewan Jones is is someone that I saw m- mock to them. I think that's a little high for the. That's the 6'8", 360 pounder that was Big like board. putting dudes in the dirt and at the Senior Bowl. I, I don't know that I go uh, eleven, but he's another guy to, to keep in mind. And that's what I'm saying when I mentioned earlier how they said that there's 14 guys with a valid first round. Dewan Jones, right? Darnell Wright from from Tennessee. Like we're just we just went over oh, yeah. four to five first round tackles. You see what I'm saying? Mm. So and, and we mentioned a first round because we know that Quentin Johnson is going to go first round. So that's six players right there, just casually talking shop. There's mm. there's thirty to forty players that should have a first round grade on. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry, Jared. Go ahead. No, I said absolutely. No, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so real quick, the last question I have for I think one of the mo- more intriguing um, players to look at when you look at the 2023 season is Robert Wood. So obviously the wide receiver room last year was nothing to write home about. Injuries had a, it's somewhat of a factor in that, but this is a wide receiver group that really needs improvement next year, uh, yes. I think, in all aspects. But, you know, when you're in that situation, you have a guy like Robert Woods, who's, I believe, slated to make close to $14 million next year. Uh, I think it's a, a tough line to toe. Like, should you try to go as young as you can and, and, and build through the draft, high draft picks? Do you keep him and maybe go further into free agency? Where do you th- what pool do you think the Titans are going to pick from this year to try to alleviate their their issues at the wide receiver position more? Yeah, I think it's going to be from the from the draft. It's more than likely they're going to try to go a little bit cheaper. Uh, Robert Woods is interesting because all of the cap savings that you have, I mean, it's like ten to eleven million dollars. So that that changes a lot of things. So if you could release him and sign, you know, a guy like a uh, Nelson Aguilar, uh, uh, Miko Hardman, you know, you, those are inexpensive veterans. So now you have veterans in the locker room still and in the lineup, and it's not all young receivers. So uh, that's a, a direction I could see them going. But um, Robert Woods, he had a tough year, but I still feel he's a, he's a solid player. Remember the ACL, that's something he tore it late, you know. So he he says that he's good, but I, I think that there's still more – um, p- production from him a- as he gets further away from that injury. Yeah, and Jim White was one of the guys we had on a couple of weeks ago, and he did say that he would like to see Robert Woods back, you know, in yeah. 2023. Um, just be- before we uh, start wrapping things up, I really got to ask you a question. You said you were going to the NFL uh, Combine uh, yeah. within the next couple of weeks over here. Any sleepers that you want to see as Titan fans, as we're on the couch, any, any guys like on your list that you want to see blossom at the Combine? That you haven't mentioned right now, besides flowers and uh, yeah, so these are sleepers. Um, you know, I, I hope Jonathan Mingo runs well, I, I really do. Um, I, I like him as a player, but there's a guy out of Princeton, um, Andres Ishovis. I, I can never pronounce his last name, but watch him, he's gonna, 
he's going to kill the combine. I, I'm telling you, he's he's a heptathlete. Um, he ran the fastest 60 meter portion of, of the heptathlon, I, I think in, in Princeton history, I want to say. But yeah, he's and he showed off down at the senior ball. I, I think he's someone to watch. Um, there's there's a lot of guys that are sleepers, but those are two that I personally want to see do well just because, you know, for Mingo, he has to show that he could run in order to. Yeah, I, I really like him coming into this draft yeah. too as well. Yeah, no doubt. Well, TD, uh, we really, really appreciate you coming on. Obviously, in the sports world, very, very busy, and, and there's so much coming up that we're going to love to see you cover. And hopefully sometime down the road when you've had more time to scout these these young guys on the horizon, we can talk to you again and pick your brain a little bit more. But uh, really, can't thank you enough. Big fan of yours and everything that you do for the, for the organization, for us fans. And uh, we wish you all the best and hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. About to Thanks. jump into some film now. <laughs> Thanks, CD. All right. Coming on, man. Have a good night. Thanks sure. a Take lot. Take it easy. All Take right. Care. Toronto Davenport, very, very big name in the Titans media game, and we really appreciate the time he spent with us. Uh, solid 30 minutes. Excellent, excellent info that he gave us. Absolutely good um, to pick his brand for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like I said earlier, he's an X's and O's guy, X's and O guys, and that's, those are always the guys that you, you want to talk football with because – you know, they bring a lot more to the table than just the typical, I like this guy, I like, I hate that guy. They can go in depth and explain to you why they like someone uh, that, that the, the the casual football fan wouldn't be able to do. So, um, yeah, excellent stuff. We're going to we're definitely wrap it up for tonight. Uh, I, as always, as I mentioned at the end, which I need to start mentioning in the beginning, if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you thumbs up, comment, subscribe, tell your friends. Uh, we're building our family each and every week. And we want to continue to do that. So we need all the help we can get. Any of the podcast platforms do as well. Uh, subscribe, comment, share with your friends. And uh, like I said, I'm going to I say this every week, but, you know, we've only been skipping it because we've had so many awesome guests on. But uh, I've had a lot of feedback from people wanting to get, you know, hear their side of things and, and their takes. And we want to bring fans on. We really want to do things. Maybe we'll start up a hotline, things like that, just to uh, increase the engagement. Vinny, I'm sure can, would, can't wait to hear some of the things that uh, – some of my loyal haters have. Um, but uh, anything you guys want to throw in before we wrap up for uh, tonight's show? AJ Brown didn't win a Super Bowl this year. He did not. <laughs> he did not. Well, that's all we got for tonight. We always thank you for joining in. Uh, and always tighten up. Tighten Sammy, up. Send me out. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast, Talking Titans, on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.